Hello everyone, welcome back to the Tokyo Living Podcast Injury Edition. Today we're going to be talking about running footwear, running shoes. Uh, we're going to be discussing what they do, uh, the different types of running shoes, and the impact of these different types of shoes on uh, injury uh, risk and, uh, and injury rehabilitation, as well as running performance. Now, why is it important to talk about this? Um, well, for runners, uh, obviously one of the beauties of running is that it can be done you know, anywhere, anytime. Um, you don't need a, a partner and you need very little equipment. Um, the only real equipment that you need is your shoe. Um, but for this reason, so much attention is placed on this one piece of equipment that's required. So what is the shoe's role in running as an activity? With any sort of physical activity, with any sort of sport, with any sort of movement, um, we have to analyse the interactions between you know, every different segment of the body um, and how those interactions you know, work together to produce that movement. Um, we're looking at how those interactions may cause specific stress at a certain area. Um, and you know, in the take case of an injury, we're looking at how that specific stress may cause an overload of a particular tissue and then lead to a painful experience for the individual. In terms of pe uh, performance, we're looking at how the interaction between all those different uh, aspects, those different joints, those different muscles, uh, it can be optimised to uh, improve performance, to, in the case of running, uh, improve efficiency if we're talking about long distance running. Um, and uh, in the case of uh, you know, sprinting, for example, we're looking at how we coordinate those segments to produce as much power uh, as possible in the running movement. The shoe's role in that is obviously to provide a buffer between the foot and the running surface, the external environment. And this may be uh, an outside running surface, uh, so, so concrete or, or grass or whatever we're running, from, from, from running on outside, or an external running surface uh, like a treadmill. When we're talking about that interaction between the foot and the ground, it's not just one segment that we're considering as the foot. And so the foot is made up, as you know, I think most people inherently understand, a lot of bones and therefore uh, a lot of joints because each, each bone has a, a joint between um, that and the adjacent bone. And so when we're running, there is a certain degree of movement occurring at all those different interactions just within the foot, just within that part of the body that is in contact with the shoe, which is then in contact with the ground. Now, this is outside the scope of a, a podcast such as this. Um, we can obviously uh, get very, very uh, deep into the biomechanics of uh, running and even just what happens at the foot. Uh, it's very, very intricate and complicated. We're gonna break it down into the main movements that are happening at the foot. Uh, um, that, that you know, are relevant to the, uh, the function of the shoe. The first thing to consider is that running, by definition, includes what we call a flight phase. So this means that at a certain uh, phase in the gait cycle when we're running, neither foot is in contact with the ground. And this means that when the foot does come into contact with the ground, it, uh, it does so with a certain amount of impact. It's not like uh, we're just putting the foot down and using that to lever the rest of the body over the foot, um, which is you know, closer to the biomechanics of, of walking. Uh, but when we're running, you know, our whole body weight is coming down through the foot, through the shoe, if we're wearing shoes, and into the ground. Um, and so obviously there, there is a certain amount of, uh, of, of you know, higher velocity load and uh, an impact that occurs at that time. We also have what we call a ground reaction force. So for every amount of force that goes into the ground when the foot hits the ground, um, we get a, an equal and opposite force coming back up. And this is what we call the ground reaction force. We are talking about the biomechanics. So, so that's um, what we call uh, kinetics. Um, so the actual, you know, the changes in force, the changes in location uh, force that happens with movement. Um, and then we also have what we call the kinematics. So this is what we talk, talk more about sort of joint angles. Um, now, as I said before, yeah, an in-depth look at the biomechanics of the foot and ankle is outside the scope of this episode. Um, so we're going to break it down into uh, two basic planes. Uh, so we have the sagittal plane, which is basically forward and backwards movement. Um, and then we, we're going to talk about the, the frontal plane, which is the side to side movement. 
Um, now, none of these movements happen in isolation, but I think uh, to make things easy, we're just going to separate it into these two uh, broader categories. So in terms of our sagittal plane movement, we have uh, what we call dorsiflexion. So if you imagine pulling the toe up toward the whole foot up towards you, um, and then we have plantar flexion when we're going the opposite direction, so moving uh, uh, the foot down and sort of straightening out the ankle. Um, so as we come in contact with the ground, before the foot hits the ground, we have an element of dorsiflexion, and this is basically to preload the calf muscles. So when we're bending the leg up, we're basically putting the calf on stretch, so that when the foot hits the ground, that calf is working to, uh, to buffer some of that force. And not only the calf, but in particular the Achilles tendon, which has a really important role in shock absorption and, um, and energy transfer within the lower limb. Um, as we start to move the knee and the hip and the rest of the body over the foot, the foot goes into uh, more dorsiflexion. So that causes more of that uh, lengthening of the calf. Um, but the whole time that the calf is lengthening, it's still uh, under uh, active tension. So the, you know, you're getting a, a contraction of that muscle, um, but it's happening while it's lengthening. As we start to move our body over uh, the foot, and we call this sort of the mid stance uh, phase of the motion, and then as we start to move the, the foot behind us or move our body forward over the foot and then push the foot off the ground, then the ankle starts to go into plantar flexion. Now, I'm talking about the ankle as that's where visually, especially if someone's wearing shoes, we're seeing most of the movement occurring. However, we are getting you know, plantar flexion and dorsal flexion through all the joints uh, throughout the foot, and in particular through the big toe. And obviously, um, depending on the, the shoe, the, the shoe itself can have an influence over all those joints. When we talk about our frontal plane movement, uh, we're talking about, uh, in gross terms, uh, supination and pronation. Now, these are actually combined movements, um, but if we think about um, you know, holding your foot out and tilting the foot to the outside, um, that's what we would call pronation. And then when we're tilting it inwards, that's what we would call supination. If you've then got your foot on, your gr on the ground and we're you know, considering these movements in what we call a closed chain pattern, um, supination would be where a little bit more of the weight is on the outside of the foot. And then pronation is where more of the weight is on the inside of the foot. And I think that, um, um, you know, a lot of people will be familiar with these terms, uh, pronation and supination. However, um, I think because of, as we'll talk about uh, in a minute, um, the development of the sports shoe industry, uh, the, these terms, and in particular pronation, has sort of been uh, almost given a diagnostic label. Um, you know, I've had many uh, people come in to see me in the clinic and say, oh, you know, I've, I've been diagnosed as a pronator, uh, as if it's um, yeah, a, a diagnosis in and of itself. Um, pronation and, and supination are, are very normal and necessary movements to occur um, at the foot and ankle when we walk and when we run. And these movements um, primarily occur at what we call the subtalar joint, which is the joint that uh, is between the heel and uh, what we call the talus, which is sort of the next joint up. Uh, from the heel. Um, however, that, that movement in the frontal plane occurs as, as uh, with the forwards and backwards, the sagittal plane movement, it, it occurs throughout the whole foot. And so that whole foot is contributing uh, to that movement. When the foot initially comes into contact with the ground, um, it will be in a position of supination. As we then roll over the foot, it goes into pronation. And then as we start to push off the ground, it rolls back into supination. Now, the degree to which uh, those movements occur will depend uh, yeah, vastly between different people, um, but it will also depend on the activity, whether we're walking, running, sprinting, whether we're cutting, changing direction, um, and, and you know, the, the speed and, and the type of movement, even within an individual, will change how much supination and pronation one is experiencing. Now, when we're talking about the shoe's role in each of those um, kin kinetic and kinematic aspects of, of gait, um, we have the stack height, which is essentially uh, how much cushion uh, is, uh, is in the shoe. And we can get um, very low uh, stack heights as you know, like the four millimeter stack, um, or we can get up to, in some of the, the super shoes, uh, up to four, uh, 40 mils or more. 
Um, and so obviously the, the more cushioning there, um, the less impact there's going to be um, with the ground, um, which inherently, um, intuitively, you know, would cause one to think that um, there is less you know, force and, and less sort of ground reaction force. However, because there is a dampening of the contact of the foot with the ground, it does mean that there is an element of, of instability and actually more muscular uh, load required. Um, so that's something to consider when we're looking at the, uh, the, the, the amount of foam, the amount of padding that's in the shoe. Um, we also have the drop height, which is you know, basically um, the difference between the heel and uh, the toe. And we can go from you know, everything from a, a zero drop height, which is uh, you know, zero millimeters uh, of, of difference. So basically those are at the same height, um, all the way up to a higher drop height, uh, which is you know, somewhere between nine and 14 mils. Now, when we have a higher heel and a, and a lower toe, um, that's going to decrease the dorsiflexion requirement. So the amount of uh, movement required in terms of bending the, the foot back. Um, it, will also, it will also encourage someone to run a little bit more uh, towards the heel. So um, this is uh, one of the reasons why um, sometimes you know, shoes with a lower drop height uh, are recommended um, to try and encourage someone to uh, have that first uh, contact with the ground um, closer towards the mid or forefoot. And then the other thing that's going to change, the amount of uh, sagittal plane movement, the, the uh, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, um, is obviously the, the structural support through the sole of the shoe. So if you have a stiffer sole, um, then that is going to limit the amount of movement, and especially as we get closer to the toe. So um, you know, unless you're wearing uh, you know, knee-high boots, uh, there's not going to be a, a lot of uh, restriction around the ankle. But in terms of the uh, sagittal plane movement that's occurring at the foot, this can be altered by uh, the stiffness of the sole and the areas in, in, in the sole uh, where there is a, a greater amount of stiffness. And then obviously in terms of you know, altering the amount of supination and pronation, uh, there can be all sorts of modifications to the shoe in terms of providing structural support <clears throat> to uh, encourage someone. It's not going to you know, stabilise per se, but it's going to encourage uh, the foot to go through a certain plane of you know, frontal plane movement. We're talking about different uh, types of shoes. Um, you know, from a historical perspective, you know, obviously when mankind started running, uh, we you know, most probably started running uh, barefoot. Uh, and then over time, uh, we obviously started walking in shoes and then um, as running became more of uh, an actual you know, exercise activity, um, we started to have more specially designed shoes for running. Um, and initially these were more of what we would think these days, as, as these days as, as minimalist shoes. So um, uh, yeah, less uh, stack and less drop so you know relatively thin and uh, not much of a difference between the heel height and the toe height as running became a much more popular pastime in the 1970s um, running shoe companies obviously wanted to take advantage of this um, by you know increasing uh, the uh, i guess perceived scientific design behind their running shoes and started to provide more padding, more cushioning, um, you know, a higher drop and, uh, and also you know, more structural support. Now, in terms of the types of shoes, um, you, know, you have your, your, I guess, traditional standard uh, shoe, which uh, in of itself covers a broad range of different types of shoes. Um, and you know different uh, amounts of sort of structural support um, within that. Um, then you have your minimalist shoes, which um, yeah, are generally very flexible, so there's not a lot of stiffness within the sole. Um, these shoes um, generally have a, a low uh, heel drop, so typically sort of four millimeters or, or, or less. Um, they have low weight, they're quite light, um, and they usually have uh, an absence of um, yeah, an external stability device. And so, yeah, so examples of, of these types of uh, shoes, uh, so something like a Vivo Barefoot, uh, a Merrell Barefoot, the Vibram Five Fingers, New Balance Minimus, uh, Nike Free. The other end of the scale, we have uh, maximalist shoes. So these are basically the opposite. So they have a high stack height, um, and uh, yeah, often a high drop uh, between the heel and toe. 
Um, and depending on the shoes, they often have um, uh, much more you know, external supportive uh, devices within the shoe. Some popular examples of maximalist shoes are things like the uh, Hocker 1-1 Clifton or Conquest, uh, Sketches Go Run Ultra 2, the Brooks, uh, the Brooks Transcend 2, New Balance Fresh Foam uh, Boracay 980, uh, Ultra Olympus, uh, the Puma Fast 1000, uh, the Vask Ultra Shapeshifter, uh, Pearl Izumi's Emotion Road M3, and the Asics uh, 33M. And then we have uh, a super shoe, uh, which is uh, you know, a little bit of a pretentious sounding uh, term for a humble pair of footwear. Um, but uh, the super shoes essentially have um, a high, high stack, similar to your maximalist shoes, um, a little bit more of a curved shape, and have a, a plate built in, and it's often a carbon fiber plate. Uh, and this basically helps provide a certain amount of, uh, of spring, and, uh, and also almost sort of functions like a, a, a tendon in terms of its ability to uh, absorb and uh, express force. And, and this, you know, theoretically will add uh, to the force produced by the lower limb and therefore um, produce uh, you know, improvements in uh, performance and in running economy. Um, popular brands of the super shoes are things like the Nike Air Zoom uh, Alpha Fly or Vapor Fly, uh, the Saucony Endorphin Pro 3, uh, the Adidas Adi Zero Adios Pro 3, the Ultra Vanish Carbon, the Asics Metaspeed Sky and Metaspeed Edge, uh, the Brooks Hyperion Elite 3, and the Puma Fast R Nitro Elite, and the UA Flow Velocity Elite. So, how is all this relevant to pain and injury? Now, if you followed um, basically anything that I've said in relation to pain and injury for a while, uh, you'll know two things. Um, one is that pain, uh, and, and therefore, as an extension of that running-related injury, is extremely complicated, is extremely complex, and there's so many different systems that, um, that are interacting and all have the potential to um, both contribute in small amounts to someone's pain experience or be the, you know, the uh, major cause of someone's pain experience. Um, and so it's unlikely that one facet, such as footwear alone, uh, is enough to drive uh, someone's pain. The thing is that um, all pain and, uh, and, and injury uh, is driven by load and a mismatch in terms of someone's you know, current load tolerance and the load that they're placing on their body or on the relevant injured structure. So when we're talking about footwear, footwear is just one aspect of load. Um, and so when we look at uh, you know, maybe a change in, in footwear, we need to understand that um, even just from a biomechanical bio perspective, if we change the load by changing the footwear, we're essentially just moving that load somewhere else. So for example, if we go into a minimalist shoe, we might uh, experience less load uh, and therefore less, therefore less stress at uh, the knee joint, but we might in fact be uh, placing more stress at the ankle and the foot. So this can be really useful when we're talking about injury rehab or injury management uh, in terms of being able to distribute the load uh, somewhere else in the body to offload a sensitized area. But when we're talking about uh, injury prevention um, for someone who hasn't experienced injury, then we've got to look at you know, all the contributing factors to someone's injury. And if there are you know, certain parts of the body that are more um, predisposed to injury in that individual, um, then maybe a particular type of shoe might be relevant for them. But in the absence of that, we've got to think about the overall load uh, and how uh, footwear selection you know, plays a part in that. The greatest injury risk comes from when we uh, move from one extreme to another. In, in any uh, activity, um, <clears throat> you know, if we go from one extreme to the other in terms of volume, so we go from running twice uh, a week to running six times a week in the same uh, session volume, then obviously that's a massive increase in load uh, and that can predispose us to injury. Um, likewise, if we move from a, a maximalist shoe and go straight to a minimalist shoe, then that 
that's a, a big change in load, even if we're doing the same amount of uh, you know, running volume. Um, and so that would set us up for a potentially higher risk of injury. So we've got to look at, um, if we're looking at changing uh, shoe type, then we've got to be looking at um, you know, what we're changing from and what we're changing to. And the bigger the deviation, the bigger the difference between our old uh, footwear and new footwear, uh, the slower uh, and, and more gradual that change needs to be. Now, what about someone's biomechanics? Um, can we use that to guide uh, shoe selection? Um, we know that um, someone's resting position of their foot, so if we just have someone standing uh, and we look at the, the static position of their foot, that has very, very little correlation with injury risk. When we're talking about running technique, um, both from a self you know, perceived running technique or even from running assessment, um, it's actually very difficult to get the amount of data required um, for it to be useful in shoe selection. So a lot of people, um, even though they might say that there are, um, you know, they, they heel strike or their midfoot strike, um, a lot of people don't actually have, even experienced runners, um, a good understanding of their running, um, running technique and, and running biomechanics. So um, it's difficult to guide someone um, based on, on their own uh, interpretation of their running technique. In terms of running analysis, now um, you know, we do perform uh, running assessments uh, within our clinic, um, but I personally uh, don't feel like we can get enough data without you know, complex um, uh, motion capture systems and, uh, and a very detailed and, and very lengthy analysis because really to, um, you know, to get good informative data, you actually have to analyze someone um, over a certain amount of time and also in a, um, a state of fatigue because you know, running injuries, unless you're, you're sprinting, uh, running injuries don't generally happen in the first couple of minutes. They happen because of that cumulative load. And some of that is a cumulative load on the tissues, but it's also um, related to the fatigue that happens both aerobically and also in the muscular system uh, that predisposes uh, that individual to excess load on the tissue. So um, again, as a general rule, looking at someone's running technique or asking about running technique also doesn't provide uh, great data in terms of shoe selection. We also uh, can see people become you know, borderline obsessed with the, the wear patterns of their shoes. Um, so where the, the soles of their shoes, um, whether it's on the inside or the outside, um, start to, to wear down. However, there's not a lot of research to, to suggest that that is relevant um, to running risk, uh, running injury risk either. So that's not something we, uh, we really put too much stock into. Um, we do look at the general wear of the shoe, but that's more just to assess you know, how beat up it looks and, uh, and, and when someone might uh, require um, you know, a purchase of a new pair of shoes. The other reason uh, touted for um, you know, the, the advantages of a minimalist shoe is that it you know, strengthens the, uh, the deeper, or what we call the intrinsic muscles of the foot. Now, there's studies to show that walking around in a barefoot shoe and doing you know, very isolated um, intrinsic muscle uh, strengthening exercises uh, produces <clears throat> similar benefits in terms of, of muscle strengthening. Um, and so, you know, from that perspective, if you're going through your normal life, if you're, um, you know, just, you know, walking around in barefoot shoes, um, or you're maybe doing resistance training in barefoot shoes, that's probably going to have a net positive effect on uh, the health of your, sh your, your foot. Um, and with specific foot and ankle conditions, that can be uh, an important part of the rehab process. Uh, <clears throat> but there's a big difference between, you know, <laughs> doing some of your running and living in uh, a barefoot or a minimalist shoe to gain strength in your intrinsic uh, foot muscles uh, than just you know, running in the shoes. And so um, yeah, if you are sort of looking at it for um, that perspective, uh, from that perspective, it's probably worth consulting with a physiotherapist or exp experienced um, trainer or strength coach uh, in this area um, to see whether that's um, something that uh, is gonna be beneficial for you. Um, I'd also say that that a lot of intrinsic foot muscle you know, strengthening programs are probably not intense enough to produce the adaptations that one might experience, um, uh, that, that, that someone might not experience with um, you know, walking around or, or running in barefoot shoes. So um, you know, I think that 
you know, even if you are going to use wearing barefoot shoes as a, a strengthening modality, that should still be supplemented with some more specific and higher load uh, foot strengthening exercises. And uh, it should also be supplemented with calf exercises. And if you're a runner really of any any kind, uh, you know, even if it's just uh, you know four or five k's a couple of times a week, I think that all runners can benefit from some supplementary uh, strength training for the calves. Um, so you, you're you're working on the capacity of the calf muscle, um, but also the the cap capacity and the load tolerance of the Achilles tendon. There's a common phrase used in you know, running uh, strength and conditioning that uh, the magic happens below the knees. Um, so you know calf strength. Uh, this is I guess as a side note, but is critically important for running. So if you are running, you're not doing your calf strengthening, then um, you should, that's really something that you can, should consider implementing in your routine. Now, one of the common uh, recommendations for shoe selection is to guide the shoe selection based on comfort. Now, this is, as me as a practitioner, is generally something that I recommend to people. So, um, if you uh, uh, if you, you are sort of happy with the shoe that you've got, but you maybe want to try something different, you know, look at picking a, a few pairs of shoes that are similar to what you have, trying them on, you know, doing a little bit of running and seeing how they feel. So amongst uh, you know, running, uh, rehab running uh, performance professionals, this is a common recommendation. However, it's important to note that um, this isn't particularly evidence-based either. So um, whilst it is something that a lot of people recommend, um, we, we also don't have uh, that much more you know, literature supporting this as a method um, than we do for some of the more, I guess, uh, complicated and uh, seemingly technical methods of uh, shoe selection. Um, however, at this time, I think that it's probably still um, the, the best option for most people is to base their shoe selection on comfort. When it comes to performance, um, this is where the super shoes uh, really sort of come into their own um, because the evidence that we have does suggest that they you know, improve uh, performance um, by around you know, 4%. Um, now this is you know, just a sort of average figure. Um, there are people that report a decrease in performance with the super shoes and there are people that um, you know, report a much, much greater improvements in performance. But <clears throat> across a, you know, the spectrum uh, with the studies that we have um, with the newer uh, super shoes, a 4% increase is around average. Now, the reason for this improvement, um, you know, we have this uh, stack height, high stack height, which allows uh, more foam and, and different types of foam. So, you know, generally, um, you know, the traditional filling of a, a sole of a shoe is EVA foam, which has uh, about a 65% energy return. Um, the uh, newer super shoes, such as the Nike Vape, Vaporfly, um, have up to an 87% energy return. So it's basically just more spring in the foam that's in the shoe. As we mentioned before, uh, there's a carbon fiber plate built into the shoe, and this basically helps with that energy return as well. And it also decreases the force requirements from um, uh, you know, aspects of the midfoot. And unlike with other types of shoes, it doesn't seem to transfer uh, that force to other areas. So it's basically just decreasing the overall force requirements of the foot. Um, when we talk about the performance uh, improvements, this, however, seems to be greater in, uh, in slower runners. So basically, the faster you are, the less performance, uh, that, uh, less performance improvement that you can expect from these shoes. The other thing to note is that um, these shoes do wear out a little bit quicker because of the type of foam uh, and because they have to fit so much foam into the shoe and make it light enough, um, it, it does you know, decrease the rate at which these degrade. So they're more expensive and they're not going to last as long. So um, if it's still uh, worth that um, slight improvement benefit uh, for you, there is evidence behind that. Um, but just note that you're, you're uh, going to expect you know, you know, to have to buy these re relatively regularly and, uh, and uh, yeah, a decent price tag uh, that comes along with them. Now, the last thing we'll touch on is um, how frequently we need to uh, purchase new shoes. Now, <clears throat> um, the, the, the foam in the shoes, will wear out at some point. So there is some failure point. 
and uh, it's generally sort of the, the outside of the sole of the shoe that will wear first and then once that wears out then the, the inner part um, will degrade fairly quickly. Now the common recommendation is to change shoes every 500 miles um, however this uh, was performed on EVA uh, in uh, sort of engineering designed uh, studies and, and not always in relation to shoes it's basically just testing the capacity of EVA. Um, these days not all shoes are made of EVA they're made of all types of different foam and so we don't have sort of studies for the individual foam um, that data will, will you know, come in due course um, but it's uh, at the moment we, we don't really have those sort of figures so because of that it sort of uh, becomes more important to actually look at the the as we talked about before the overall wear patterns of the sole of the shoe uh, and also the the feel and I guess the subjective feel of how the, the bottom of the, the shoe uh, interacts with the foot and how you feel that changing and the amount of cushioning and the amount of support um, over time. So in summary, um, if you are quite comfortable with the shoes that uh, you're running in, uh, but you feel like you may need to change to a minimalist or maximalist shoe for injury prevention, at this stage we don't have any real research that one is more advantageous than the other. Uh, and really comfort should be uh, the, the guide when you're choosing your shoe. If you are injured, then a shoe selection becomes a little more important and it may be worth uh, consulting with a physiotherapist um, to see if certain shoe types might be more effective uh, than the one that you're currently using to offload the sensitized area of your body that, that's uh, causing you that pain experience. If you are after an improved performance and are willing to um, pay a little bit more for the super shoe and you're comfortable running in more of that maximalist shoe um, with you know, a high drop height um, and, uh, and, and, and a thicker, more cushioned shoe, then that might be something that you want to uh, explore. And uh, as we mentioned before, uh, if you are running, then calf strengthening is a really important aspect and uh, it, it only takes you know, a couple of minutes, a couple of times a week to uh, get a good solid calf strengthening program in and that's something that I def definitely recommend. Um, and the, the, the final thing to keep in mind is that, uh, as we said at the start, um, footwear is only a small aspect of running injury risk and running injury cause. So if you are experiencing uh, injury or pain related to your running, then I think that um, yeah, it's best to consider all aspects. So um, that might be uh, your sleep, nutrition, you know, life stress, uh, the impact of other activities, the impact of work, um, and, uh, and, and how all these things may be contributing, and also you know, past injury, biomechanics, other areas of the body that might not be functioning as well as they should. All these probably have a, a much uh, larger impact on injury risk and injury cause than, than uh, the, the footwear that you're using. Um, so yeah, again, if you are experiencing uh, pain and you want uh, some, some guidance and assessment in terms of you know, what might be causing that and the relevance of your footwear, uh, then come and see us and uh, we'll do our best to help you out. Hope that was of interest to people. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll uh, look forward to seeing you on the next episode.